Um, my own background is in um, human cognitive neuroscience. Uh, and um, for ages, I've used both neuroimaging and neuromodulation tools, particularly combined to um, you know, probe certain questions about how the human brain and human cognition works. I, I thought that, that imaging plus perturbation, that interference approach, was particularly uh, valuable. And for us brain stimulators, it, it's clear that we've had a list of uh, things we would love the techniques to be able to do. And um, if we would like to study healthy human population, um, it would be great if these tools are non-invasive. If we want to say something about the neurocircuitry and the anatomy, we hope that the, these tools have some focal um, application. But it's clear to everybody that, that we've long wished for these tools to reach anywhere in the brain, not only on the surface, but also deep in the brain. Uh, conventional neurostimulation tools um, are, are somewhat limited in that respect. Consider, for example, hair um, field modeling of transcranial magnetic stimulation and, and, and transcranial direct current stimulation. These electromagnetic fields, they do penetrate the skull, but, but if you want to penetrate them deeper in the brain, you need excessive intensities. And, and that's simply a limitation of the physics of fields. A, a field will always be strongest at its source. Um, so if you want to reach deeper, you need to uh, have a higher intensity at the source, uh, and, and this becomes uh, prohibitive. But luckily, um, physics uh, doesn't stop at fields. There are other ways to remotely transfer energy, and some of them we're intimately familiar with. Consider, for example, light. Uh, the sun um, exhibits light waves, and uh, they uh, hit our retina. They bounce back and forth, and that's where they are transferred into energy that we pick up in, um, uh, with our senses and, and process in our brain. But it's, it's that very remote property of, in this case, light waves that is so particularly enticing, where we have a source billions of miles away and um, you can have it interact with material uh, at, at a very different point. Consider, for example, my memories of trying to harass a few ants with a magnifying glass we're able to control these waves and have a specific focus point where their intensity well, is intensified and a lot of energy is transferred. It, for the magnifying glass, that could even mean that um, it leads to a temperature rise um, and heating effect. Waves are wonderful things. We can create interference patterns of waves and that uh, allows us to create really complicated structures. For example, here in a 3D light hologram allows us to create these uh, very complicated patterns of interference. But light, even though it's very suited for remote energy delivery, is not very well suited for applications of brain stimulation. We're all familiar with object genetics, but generally light does not penetrate well through biological tissue. It is absorbed and scattered immensely quickly. And it has something to do, at least, with the wavelength of light. Well, luckily, uh, physics of waves is not limited to light. Uh, consider sound. Here we have ultrasound, and we're all familiar with this, especially in the case of diagnostic imaging, where we have a focus of ultrasound that we rapidly scan back and forth, and we listen to the um, sound reflections that we can process and display on the screen. But if we keep that focus point of ultrasonic waves at one spot, and we really crank up the intensity, we can visualize this property of waves. So here on the right, we have a single element transducer. It's concave, it's actually really big. It's in a water tank, and um, because of its shape, it will focus sound waves at one point in this perspex, it's plastic cup. It's a solid cup. And now it's translucent, but in a second, we're going to switch on the sound. And at the peak focus, the intensity is high enough that it crosses a threshold that it actually disrupts the plastic crystals. So um, the property I want you to, to appreciate here is that that threshold effect is at the focal point, remote from its source, but also that there is no interference um, in, in the path of the waves, that we can really structure them accurately. Now, and this uh, property of sound waves has been um, utilized in, um, in biomedical applications for decades, but particularly the last, in the last decade, this has rapidly um, uh, evolved, and people are using it for remote incisionless neurosurgery. Consider, for example, here the FDA-approved 
um, um, treatment for essential tremor. Essential tremor is uh, when patients ha have a persistent and continuous tremor, um, uh, in this case, in their hand, and you can see it in their writing and in their drawings. And an associated circuit with it is particularly mediated through a nucleus in the thalamus. This is this nucleus is called the VIM, the ventral intermediary nucleus. And if you would cut away that nucleus, you're also removing the tremor symptom. Cutting away would be a very invasive surgery. But the surgery using ultrasound, by combining a thousand beams, we're able to deliver energy at one specific point. And you can see, actually, if you do, do this with high enough intensity, it would result in a temperature rise. And in the right MR image, you see a little dark gray dot uh, in the thalamus, in the middle of the brain, indicating that actually there was a focal lesion of the VIM. And this results in an um, disappearance of the tremor symptoms. Well, for a patient, it might look a little bit um, something like this. A patient at a central tremor has a big impact on uh, daily life. But here they come in surgery, their head is shaved, they're in a big helmet with a thousand transducers, and they all go in with helmet and all in the MR scanner. And this allows the clinicians to check uh, the temperature and where they are there. If they think they're at the right spot, they raise the temperature a bit, they ask and see if the tremor is gone, and then they raise it to the 50 degrees temperature for the full ablation. And this is at the end of the surgery. The patient is coming out, and you can see again the shaved head and the stereotactic frame. But this is about two hours after the whole operation started. And about four hours after they were admitted to the hospital, they can leave again. And this particular patient lived with tremor for 30 years. You can see what, what kind of an impact it might have on somebody's life. Deep brain stimulation is the most common surgical intervention for uh, tremor, but um, focused ultrasound um, uh, thalamotomy is fast becoming an alternative, um, especially in the US, but also globally. And because it's associated with lower risks, it's also uh, applicable for patients who otherwise would not be eligible for deep brain stimulation. These types of surgery are, are performed on a daily basis around the globe, and they rely on high intensity ultrasound, right? It's really neurosurgery. Um, and they use about a thousand elements uh, coming uh, from all over the head. And that allows uh, such a precise focality of the stimulation. And just to illustrate that focality to you, here is a map, a T2 weighted image uh, that shows nine black dots in the white matter of an Alzheimer's patient. In a first in human study, um, they were opening the blood brain barrier at these nine specific points. And you can really appreciate how precise and focal this can be if you combine all those thousand elements. Well, this blood brain barrier opening is done at low intensities, but it can be combined with um, lipid microbubble injection in the blood that start oscillating at the ultrasonic frequency and a push open the blood brain barrier. You can appreciate it. We have a tool for neurosurgery and we have a tool for opening the blood brain barrier. These are very exciting opportunities for treatment, especially of neurological disorders and uh, cancer. It's a rapidly expanding field, and uh, these are interventional and, and clinical treatment options. Uh, they're now boosted because ultrasound makes it possible, especially the ultrasound engineering to go through the skull. But um, uh, th these approaches for remote energy delivery can be combined with many other techniques. Uh, we talked about intensity uh, surgery at high intensity, opening the blood brain barrier. Um, we I'll be mostly talking about low intensity neuromodulation. Other people working on drug delivery with a lipid or nano containers that contain drugs that you burst, or actually a combination with a viral expression of ion channels to lead to somogenetics. So basically optogenetics, but then anywhere in the brain, even deep in the brain, or functional neuroimaging uh, with high-speed computational approaches combined with uh, microbubbles. The last one hasn't penetrated through the skull yet, but uh, developments are going quickly. So just to give you a flavor of, of, of how the, this could be going on, um, consider, for example, that some uh, engineers are developing specific holographic acoustic lenses, these holographic plates that allow to really shape the um, ultrasonic wave patterns and tailor it on a subject-by-subject -subject basis to specific 
um, uh, neural structures. For example, this is the hippocampus. And if you would um, use another holographic plate, you can do the other hippocampus or you can split. In fact, you can create acoustic holograms inside the skull with enough computational power and engineering know-how. But also consider ultra-fast, high-resolution, functional neuroimaging using ultrasound, where there's blood flow imaging and resolutions, spatial and temporal resolutions, far outpacing fMRI. As I said, this hasn't penetrated the skull yet, um, but these computational approaches are uh, quickly developing. These are many different approaches of um, and uses of ultrasound. But I think um, for today, I am actually going to focus on low intensity ultrasonic neuromodulation. So there is no additive combination with holographic plates or no actually combination with micro bubbles. It, it is just ultrasound on neural tissue. And at the, currently, there, there are many different names that people or abbreviations that people use to refer to exactly the same thing. And um, I, I'm not going to list all of them here, but uh, there are a few that I would like to highlight that, of course, the most brilliant abbreviation is FUN, Focused Ultrasound Neuromodulation. Uh, this was coined by Jérôme Sellet, um, a PI at Oxford with whom I closely collaborated. Um, but I'll be referring to this as transcranial ultrasound stimulation. Uh, this is boring, it's decent, and I don't think there are any of the objections that um, we have for the, um, uh, the other abbreviations, but I just want you to know that they all mean pretty much the same thing um, uh, in whatever context they're used. Now, the, the TUS abbreviation is um, mostly taken to be associated with other non-invasive brain stimulation techniques like TMS or TCS or TES, electrical current or magnetic stimulation. Here we're talking about transcranial ultrasound stimulation. And the field, in fact, is a lot older than uh, these abbreviations or names. Consider, in fact, that in the uh, late 50s, uh, the Fry brothers, here is William Fry, were already using focused ultrasound for a partial basal ganglia uh, lobotomy in a Parkinsonian patient. At that time, uh, their equipment was fantastic, but the computational power needed to correct for abbreviations of the skull and actually get the ultrasonic waves to pass through the skull weren't available yet. So this required a partial um, opening in the skull. But nonetheless, this is late 50s, and this is neurosurgery using focused ultrasound. And it's the same William Fry that has uh, really pioneered low intensity ultrasonic neuromodulation. For example, in one of the seminal papers, he was shown the visually evoked potential of the cat uh, with a visual stimulus before, during sonication, and afterwards. And here you can see that then neuromodulation by ultrasound is reversible. The, the technique somewhat got forgotten for a little while, but has really been rediscovered in the last 10 years. And part of this, that it needed a rediscovery is because people either lost interest, it's because uh, we were focused on, on other problems and, and other solutions, but to a large extent it's also because we simply didn't believe that it could be true that by delivering acoustic energy, you could affect uh, neuronal activation. I myself have been extremely skeptical for many years until uh, in our lab, it was experiment after experiment after experiment that uh, gave us enough confidence that actually we're looking at something that is real. And many other labs have a similar experience where they needed a lot of convincing and before they um, um, allowed themselves to continue. When we're talking about ultrasonic neuromodulation, most people would assume that it's in fact the ultrasonic waves, these high frequency waves that are uh, doing most of the job. I, I don't think that's entirely true. Uh, in fact, that there's not a lot of there, I am not aware of any empirical evidence that that is true. It, it would also be slightly surprising because biological tissue um, is usually too elastic and stiff, a combination of both, to allow for such rapid movements. And, the, the wavelength of ultrasonic waves is small, but, but not ridiculously small. It's about, uh, could be about three millimeters, for example. Um, so 
but quite large with relative to molecular sizes. Now, instead, there is a lot of evidence that it's not the fundamental frequency of the ultrasound, but it's amplitude envelope that has an effect. Now, why is this? Ultrasound waves are in fact the carrier waves that carry signal and energy across. And when it interacts with biological tissue, um, there's an energy transfer. And that energy transfer has two effects. One is a mechanical force, and the other one is heating, a thermal effect. We can control the, the thermal effect relatively well, and, and we can limit this and assure that it actually the thermal effect is very low. Yet there would still be an acoustic radiation force away from where the beam is coming. And the most suggestions, but this definitely isn't set in stone, are that these this acoustic radiation force is the primary mechanism of action. For example, if you would push or increase pressure on an ion channel, uh, it will affect the probability of this ion channel opening and closing. Most ion channels, not only the mechanosensitive, but most ion channels are actually anchored in a cytoskeleton. And by changing the pressure, even without the displacement, you would change the permeability because you're changing the tension on this system. Indeed, if we remove ion channels, then neuromodulation is nearly absent. If we remove the cytoskeleton, but leave the ion channels in place, again, most of the neuromodulation is um, lowered, but not all of the neuromodulation effects. Even without the cytoskeleton and ion channels, there seems to be still some neuromodulation. That's slightly strange because all that's left is a membrane. And I think at this stage, we have to realize that the membrane is a, a, a liquid crystal. These are uh, lipid bilayers um, that are polarized and they are, are structured with a certain orientation with respect to each other. And if you put tension on them, you're going to change their conformational state. And that changes the capacitance across the membrane and therefore its potential. So they either become slightly closer or further away from the threshold for action potentials. And this can explain why it, it, it mostly is a neuromodulatory activity, right? You make an action potential slightly more likely or less likely. If you sonicate and stimulate at moderately high intensities, that modulation might be so strong that you're evoking action potentials, but it doesn't necessarily need to be. And for example, we can compare what we know from a difference between transcranial magnetic stimulation and transcranial current stimulation, both neuromodulatory tools. Now, in, uh, we've been using ultrasound for decades, and we're quite familiar with the bio effects. And the two main ones that we uh, take along uh, regarding safety are cavitation, and that's the uh, forceful implosion of vacuum bubbles that you can create if you have peak negative pressures, so at high intensities, and thermal effects, which is that the transfer of energy actually leads to uh, heating. Uh, both of them can be quantified. We know quite well how they work. It also means that because we can rely on decades of experience with ultrasound in biological tissue, the developments here in safety assessments can go relatively quickly, a lot quicker than they will be if this is a completely novel technique. In the literature, you might find that there are a few more um, um, proposed methods or, or mechanisms um, and, and I think actually there, there are more than I've listed here, uh, membrane waves or sound operation. Uh, most of them are theoretical models uh, that we definitely should not exclude um, and more research is needed, uh, but they're, they're not currently supported by empirical evidence, right? This is such a young field uh, that there's definitely a lot more research to be done. Rory, I'm just checking if everybody's still alive. We're all good. Uh, we do have one question. I just didn't want to interrupt your, your flow. Um, it's asking, is it possible and safe to stimulate the brain stem with ultrasound? If so, can it be focused enough to stimulate specific nuclei? Oh, well, that's usually a question that I would get at the end. Yeah. And it's, it's not the first time I get this question. And um, it, it, it deserves its own hour, I'm afraid. Uh, so there are a few points that I'm just briefly going to make, and we can always discuss it later. So first... Technically, yes, it's very possible. It would require um, some either home build or prototype devices uh, to be able to reach at that particular place. There's no commercially available stimulator that could do so spe 
uh, with specificity. But, but there's really no engineering limit to do this, right? You could build it if you, if you have the know-how. And actually, there, there are quite a few people and quite a few labs who do have the know-how. And a, a few of them even are considering doing this. You could go down to a resolution of, if you do this really properly, a resolution of about a millimeter in the brainstem. And so actually, that is very very relevant size for the brainstem. Uh, it's even a little bit problematic because uh, the brainstem moves with breathing and pulsation of uh, cardiac pulsation more than a millimeter. So there are lots of other troubles and problems that you get into um, at, at that very high resolution. Now, we've tended to stay clear of the brain stimulation in our experiments. Actually, usually we really try to avoid it, and that's because there are breathing centers and cardiac centers in the brainstem. So we take a lot of precaution um, in this situation where, where we are still in a young field. And we might not entirely know uh, what the effects are or how long they might last and how they might differently affect different brain regions. But because it's technically possible, um, because it's mostly an engineering challenge, everything is possible. So if, if you have some money to spend and, uh, and some time to do this properly, I expect that in only a, a couple of years, uh, we'll see the first focal um, brainstem neuromodulation. Um, I, 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 th I think I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that, Rory. Is there any other question? Uh, yeah, a couple more have just rolled in um, whilst you're answering that one. Uh, sure. This one is very good. I've actually thought about this myself. Uh, what is your take on the comparison of TMS and TUS? Would it make sense to use TUS also in areas close to the surface to increase the spatial focality of the stimulation and target slash dissociate cortical subregions? Oh, I'm laughing. Um, there are a few proposals out there uh, that are e exactly on this. There is no paper. Um, so no, actually, I, I'm not aware of any ongoing research, but I, I know that a few people have considered and discussed this. I think it, it's a great suggestion. There are a few open questions because we're not entirely sure how the different physiological mechanisms of TUS and TMS will interact. So we're, we're not even entirely sure at what time they would need to be combined. Um, TAS can definitely reach uh, superficial areas. In fact, many people are doing so. Uh, my lab and, and collaborators of mine will probably be um, uh, doing this in, in the motor system because we know it so exceptionally well. And um, I know that, that a few of the labs that I work with are, are considering to see if they can improve the focality of TMS by uh, combining it with TUS. So everything is possible. They're just empirical questions on how they will interact. And I think it, if I would advise anything, is that the motor system is the, the, the best system to tap this because we just know it so well. We know it an anatomy really carefully. Anything else, Rory? Well, we got we got three more. Sure. Do you want to, uh, do you want to take them now or move on? No, let's, let's go. Uh, the questions, I mean, sorry. Yeah, so there's one, uh, I know you cover this later on in detail. So you yep. can choose to answer it now or wait for it to be covered towards the end where I know you yep. cover it. Uh, I recently read a paper about transcranial pulse stimulation with ultrasound mm -hmm. and how it was used in Alzheimer's disease. Yeah. How does this differ from the te techniques you are describing? So I, I, I do have a slide on this, um, but the one thing I want to say here is that actually engineering wise, it's not dramatically different, except that this is not an ultrasonic wave, but the TPS is a shock wave that is used for um, a kidney stone blasting, right? So you're actually using the mechanical force to to uh, burst uh, kidney stones. Uh, the, these kidney stones are highly absorbent of acoustic energy. That's why this can work. And they're using the same device at a slightly lower intensity on the brain. Well, they're not entirely sure how or why it works. And actually, nobody's really sure if it works. But I'll be discussing this in, in one slide at the end. Cool. And then we'll just do a couple, a couple more, and then we'll move on. Uh, mm -hmm. Are effects on gray matter or tracts? Are the effects on gray matter or tracts? Might it be possible to modulate activity in a specific spinal cord tract, e.g. the dorsal column? Oh, brilliant one. So um, first, gray matter. Yes, I'll be talking about gray matter effects extensively. But then the tracts is, is a white matter question. And um, from Shunshik Yu's lab, 
uh, at, uh, at Harvard in Boston, there, um, there are indeed suggestions that it also modulates white matter tracts. Um, I think the rodent evidence is not entirely convincing. It's really hard to be absolutely sure where you're focality, where you're stimulating. But he also has some really encouraging evidence from annelids, so from earthworms uh, with a big myelinated um, uh, exon in the back. It's an open question. And in fact, I know a few people who are looking into this track modulation. They're starting at white matter inside the brain. And part of it is that the getting the ultrasonic focus inside the, um, back, the, the spine is really complicated uh, because of the shape of the spine and uh, it, it being rounded with so much um, bone tissue. You could get really complicated interference patterns of reflecting and standing waves. And it requires exceptional modeling and control. Um, and usually that, 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 that's not, an, it's not impossible, but it's, it's a difficult task. And there are a few people who are considering this uh, for treatment of gait, for example, again, in Parkinson's, freezing of gait, uh, where they're trying to have a few of these modulations, but it's not currently available. One more, Rory, or? Yeah, one more, yeah. Uh... In depression, will TFUS be able to specifically target the frontal limbic system? Answer is yes. Great. I mean, th this is basically what, what uh, I now know at least five labs will be doing. And we know that it's possible because actually that's the exact circuit that we modulated in monkeys. And in monkeys, is more difficult than in humans. And uh, most of our papers are showing that it works, that we can do this. The question, of course, is will it alleviate depression symptoms? And I think that is, is, is an enormously complex and important question. And it really requires a combination of these engineers and neuroscientists to make it possible, but then also the psychiatrist on, on how best to design your treatment around a neuromodulatory therapy. Um, this is an open question and there are a few different hypotheses around in, in the world, but hopefully we can rely on already working TMS treatment options um, and and uh, amplify them, build, stand on those shoulders, shoulders when we're designing uh, TUS treatment options for example, mood or anxiety disorders. Um, Fantastic. So we will answer. And then in the name of smoothness, we will move on. Is that okay? Sorry, yeah, so uh, you just dropped out. Is there one more question coming or? Oh no, we'll, we'll move on oh. now. We'll uh, okay. play the rest. Yeah. So, um, this was an introduction up to here on um, some of the background. And uh, for the re remainder, I'll be talking about the uh, neuromodulatory effects. So finally, now after half an hour, it becomes exciting. And I'll round off at the very end on some broader visions on um, how we can move forward as a field. And I'll, I'll, I'll try to do this at, I'm afraid, the same high pace that I've kept in the beginning. Uh, please don't shy away from asking questions or contacting Rory or me personally later on uh, to help for clarify them. And Rory, uh, you can just shout out if you do want to interrupt me. Okay. No, um, I said it's an old technique. It's been rediscovered. And I think we owe a lot of credit to Jamie Tyler. Um, and uh, for example, this um, seminal work um, in in vitro work showing that ultrasonic stimulation in hippocampal slices leads to neuronal activity. And if you block it with a TTX blocker, ion channels are blocked and actually the action potentials are gone. So this really shows that ultrasound at a moderately high intensity can lead to action potentials. And from here, it, it has rapidly moved to uh, rodent studies. And also these moderately high intensity sonication in rodents lead to um, muscle, uh, to, to, to motor responses. For example, it might look something like this. This is a rat. Every second, there is an ultrasonic burst of 300 milliseconds. And pretty much every second, but here there's a skip, the, there's a twitch. Now, many people would wonder, oh, does this mean that ultrasonic ultrasound, like TMS, has a motor evoke potential? It's very tempting to, to make that link, but it's probably a bit uh, too early. Namely, there is a, a, a massive delay of about 40 to up to 200 or even 400 milliseconds between the onset of the ultrasound and the, uh, mo uh, the muscle twitch. Then further in rodents, it hardly seems to matter 
um, where you hold, where you focus your ultrasound. Uh, and part, this could be that actually it's not an ultrasonic neuromodulation, but an acoustic effect of how your protocol is designed. It could also be that in rodent skulls that are so small, and the sound wave just bounces in many places, and you also reach deep subcortical structures, motor structures in the rodent, no matter from where you are targeting. Um, we're, we're, the field is still discovering this. Nonetheless, it, these rodent studies allow an exceptional control over the parameters. And this is more of a, a reference slide for you to consider. Um, um, there are many studies, and I'm just listing one example here, that are looking at how the motor response is dependent on the intensity or the a duty cycle of your specific protocol, um, or how long that uh, that burst is. But the most important thing that I would like you to recognize is that often the outcome measure is not the amplitude of the EMG, but the success rate. You saw that in, in the video, right? So you saw that nearly every second there was movement, but then it skipped once, there was no movement at all. So it, it often is a little bit binary. Right, that there's a success rate of such and such percentage. And in that sense, it's already a little bit different than a TMS. But of course, the delay with the onset is massively different too. This is not an electrical stimulation, and it, it really seems that it needs some ramping up uh, before there's activation. Now, lastly, for you to remember, is that actually in large animals, and especially in primates, motor responses have never been observed. And people definitely have tried. Um, so in rodents, we see these muscle twitches, but we don't see them in primates. What we do see in primates is neuromodulation, right? So um, ever since uh, Jamie Tyler with Win Legon in 2014, um, there are actually quite a number of studies that have used focused ultrasound um, in humans, mostly on primary sensory motor cortices. And in many cases, um, as you can see here, these are relatively simple setups with a single element, and that leads to a focus point that is really like the cigar shaped, an ellipsoid. Um, they're easy to maintain and easy to control, and they already do their job. Um, consider, for example, this model field in the thalamus, in the third panel. In nearly all of these studies, the reported effect is one of neuromodulation, um, so not a motor response. Um, and I think perhaps in this study by Wind Light on, um, it, it's most elegantly um, uh, exemplified where there is a TMS, motor evoked potential, and you see the black line here. On the X axis is the intensity of the TMS machine, and on the Y axis is the amplitude of the motor evoked potential, and you see this dose response curve. And the whole dose response curve is shifted down, is inhibited um, when the TMS is delivered simultaneously with the ultrasound. Um, it, it, this is a, a, a relatively straightforward figure, but in fact, it really matched uh, recordings of EEG as well. This is the 2014 paper, where if you compare the sham in black with the red, the ultrasonic stimulation, you again see this modulation and inhibition of a visually evoked potential. Sorry, this is some other sensory evoked potential. But you can also appreciate that it, it really is a modulation of, a, of an evoked potential, and it usually in, in most of our studies, the ultrasonic stimulation is about 300, or in this case, 500 milliseconds long. Right? It's very different from a, a TMS pulse. Up to date, and up to most neuroimaging, uh, sorry, neuromodulation studies with ultrasound show effects during the sonication, but not afterwards. It, it, there, there are only online effects, but not a lot of evidence of offline effects. And we in Oxford were particularly interested in that. And we wanted to both to further develop it as a tool for cognitive neuroscience, where we have an offline effect that lasts for about an hour, say, that allows us enough time to run an experiment after the uh, ultrasound. But we were also particularly interested to develop new methods that could modulate plasticity and therefore be combined, for example, with cognitive behavioral therapy so that you actually have a boosted effect that lasts longer and maybe even develop it further for uh, clinical treatment options. We already uh, briefly discussed depression. Now, so we scoured the literature and there's actually some early evidence, for example, this paper from Shunchik uh, uh, Yu that showed with that 
particular protocol that there is some longer lasting effect for a few minutes after the sonication. And we were particularly struck by this work in, um, from Virginia, from Della Piazza in pink thalamus. And again, there is a, a protocol that has most of its effect actually after the sonication. These effects are very um, focal and specific. And the protocol that they used was a repetitive ultrasound protocol. And repetitive in the sense that they used about a 10 hertz repetition of a longer burst. So here, a single ultrasound burst lasted about 30 or 40 milliseconds, and that was repeated 10 times a second. This is what we built upon and what we used for testing. in um, uh, First in Paris with Jean-Francois Aubry and, and then in, um, in Oxford. So when we started, we were keen not only for non-invasive focal whole brain neuromodulation tools, but particularly in a protocol that had long lasting effects. And knowing how we see that TMS and TDCS fields have evolved from the get go, we were interested to set something up that was robust and effective, but also where we could immediately measure these effects. Remember with ultrasound in primates, we, we don't have a, a, a motor twitch, but we still wanted to have a direct readout of the efficacy of any modulation. And in the end, of course, we wanted it to be relevant for behavior, to be able to modulate behavior. So if you're gonna pay attention to any two slides in the presentation, I, I hope to wake you up for the coming two slides and then everybody can fall back asleep again. So together with Matthew Rushworth, Jerome Soler, Jean-Francois Aubry, Pierre Pouget, and my PhD student, David Filoni, in Oxford, we set out to target the subgenual anterior cingular cortex on the left and the bilateral amygdala subcortical structures. And we adopted this repetitive uh, protocol, 10 hertz for about 40 seconds, and then based on early pilot uh, studies, and this was suggested to actually last for um, over two hours. Um, so this gave us enough confidence to put the monkeys in the scanner after repetitive ultrasound, and for over an hour, measure an offline effect using resting state fMRI. And these monkeys in the early experiments were very lightly anesthetized, but kept at a very stable physiological state. So we had perfect control over their physiology and every animal was in the exact same state. These are the perfect conditions, um, experimental conditions to, to test out these novel experiments. We spent um, uh, uh, quite some time analyzing the resting state fMRI data. And I'll, I'll just show you the end results of these analyses in heat maps that are depicting peak modulation of resting coupling really matched quite well the focus of our stimulation on the left with the ACC and on the right with the amygdala. These heat maps are the result from a comparison between a control condition with sham ultrasound and real ultrasound. And I'm just to uh, illustrate that a bit further here, uh, we're looking at uh, two uh, monkey brains. We're looking from the front from their cortical surface reconstruction. And on the left, I've indicated the amygdala with the star. That is what the seed for my analysis is. And I've looked at where in the brain activity patterns co-occur with the changes activity patterns in the amygdala. This would indicate strong coupling if they always go together. And that is what I've colored in hot colors. And you can see here that the temporal lobe and uh, orbital frontal cortex are indeed hotly colored. Uh, indicating that they're strongly coupled with the amygdala, exactly matching our anatomical knowledge of this circuit. But after ultrasonic stimulation, the repetitive ultrasound at the amygdala, this disruption, this network has been perturbed. And you can see that their coupling has been uh, disrupted. We can illustrate it here in a whole brain map. Uh, I've illustrated it in, um, uh, in a whole brain uh, heat map uh, earlier on but often we quantify this in something we call connectional fingerprint. Now compare, for example, the fingerprint of um, amygdala connections in a baseline condition, and that's the blue line. And on the circumference of this fingerprint, we have regions that we a priori selected are informative of the coupling with the amygdala. And for example, the blue line is very close to the circumference for the colon orbital regions at the bottom. But now compare the blue line to what happens after ultrasound targeted at the amygdala in yellow, we see this reduction. But that disruption only happens when ultrasound is focused on the amygdala, but not on a control region in red, the anterior cingular cortex. 
well, this type of quantification allows us quite uh, sensitive um, uh, inferences and in statistics. Uh, but but I'll, I'll have to refer to the paper for a lot more detail. I do want to illustrate to you how we approach this um, in, in many of our studies. Um, and from early on, we were interested in safety and its uh, impact. So, in fact, we uh, took a worst case scenario. And in ultrasound, ironically, that is when you stimulate close to the skull, because then a lot of ultrasound intensity is already focused at the skull. And that's the skull absorbs most of the uh, acoustic intensity and therefore has the most temperature rise. So actually often safety wise, stimulating close to the skull is a little bit more risky. And uh, so we took that as a worst case scenario. We're running acoustic simulations and you can see this uh, relatively large acoustic beam, the, the uh, ellipsoid on the right. And, and you can also appreciate some of the reflections at the bottom of the skull um, and see how important it is that you actually model this accurately. We use a relatively low ultrasonic frequency because we wanted to deliver as much energy across the skull as possible. Um, but we also uh, complemented this with relatively extensive thermal modeling. And most of the pressure or the acoustic intensity is absorbed by the skull. There also is where we see most of the heating. And our protocol was primarily limited that we did not want to heat the skull up more than 40 degrees Celsius. That's why we didn't stimulate for longer than 40 seconds. We also didn't want anything in the brain to be heating up more than a degree. And, and the part of the brain that heats up most is probably actually just below the skull um, because the heat dissipates from the skull. Now, this is different if you have a focal point that is much further inside the brain because then a lot of the energy is spread out over a larger part of the skull. But this is a worst case scenario. And we were also able to follow this up in the monkeys with histology. And I'm, I'm afraid this is a very boring slide because we didn't find any microstructural damage. You'll just have to believe me for this. And we're happy to share all slides. Um, in these targets, these are um, more superficial cortical targets. For example, the supplementary motor area. We can do another analysis of the connectional fingerprint. You can see that we have a disruption if you compare the control in blue to red after ultrasound. But it also allows us more fine-grained analysis of time. Uh, and I want to point two things out to you. First, that these effects in our ideal case with known physiological effects and very stable anesthesia are long lasting. After only 40 seconds, they could last up to two hours. But I also want to point out to you that the specifics of the effects of ultrasound will be dependent on the region that you stimulate. I could talk for hours on why we see a specific sharpening of the connectional fingerprint here, slightly different than what we see in the amygdala or the ACC or in other regions. It, it, it will be a bit, um, it will be a big assumption to say that ultrasound would work exactly the same everywhere across the brain. Instead, the effects of our ultrasound protocol are, are not so much just dependent on the structure of the ultrasound protocol as they are on its interaction with underlying physiology. Again, emphasizing why I think it's so important that we measure these effects and really quantify them. We should be expecting that they will be different for different structures, for different times, for different patient and uh, patient groups. Um, we can expect a lot of variability and complexity in this. It, it hasn't stopped us from um, trying to test the waters a little bit further and see if we could replicate some of the known effects of, of perturbing with the brain region. For example, consider um, the basal forebrain. This is usually a deep brain region. Here, this is a specific part close to the septum on the midline, close to the basal ganglia. It's involved uh, for animal in deciding when to act. So when to switch from being at rest to being engaged and being active. And um, it, this brain region had been lesioned um, uh, just a year before in a beautiful uh, paper by um, uh, Turchi et al. What they've done is an excitotoxic lesion in the base of forward, in this case, the nucleus of Maynard in one hemisphere. And then they measured the resting state fMRI coupling. And color coded here, you can see that in the hemisphere with the lesion, the whole brain coupling has been decreased, right? Now there is less global variance in the lesioned hemisphere. But remember, this is global signal coupling of resting state fMRI with a very focal lesion. It makes sense because this part of the basal forebrain is known to have acetylcholine projections all over the brain. 
these widespread connections. And we know that that's how the brain works, right? Brain regions don't not work individually, uh, but, but in a circuit. And here we have a subcortical brain region with enormously widespread connections. And if you make a lesion, it has a big impact on activity all over and coupling all over the brain. So we thought, what would happen if we targeted this with ultrasound? Now, uh, perhaps no surprise, we um, envisioned where we would like to hold the transducer and we run simulations and you can see this cigar shape. Um, and we're slightly overshooting. Um, so we did the stupid thing and we moved after 40 seconds, we moved the transducer to the other side and stimulated again for 40 seconds. And now you see the overlap where there is double stimulation and we expect there to see the strongest effect. I'm gonna quantify it in a similar way as we've done before for the amygdala. So this is a resting state whole brain coupling map and the basal forebrain is indicated with a star and you see which brain regions are strongly coupled with this um, seed region at baseline with sham stimulation. And now what happens to the coupling after ultrasound? And here you see a strong increase, right? Of the whole brain coupling. And we can quantify this change, but I, I do hope you appreciate that this is an, an increase in coupling strength and the basal forebrain. We know this brain region has whole uh, widespread connections. So we can also look remotely, for example, here at the parietal operculum. This is far remote from where our focus was, but, oh, pardon me. But still there was a remarkably strong modulation, in this case, an inhibition of the whole brain coupling of that region. And again, we can quantify this change and we can color code an inhibition with cool colors and a strengthening of coupling with hot colors. And we can do this for every point in the brain creating such a heat map. And now if you focus on the right, you can see that actually our neuromodulation was very specific. We see this very focal increase in coupling strength at or ultrasonic focus, but at the same time, we see these widespread whole brain decreases in coupling um, nearly all over uh, the brain. And um, this whole brain imaging allows us to, to, to really interpret the circuit dynamics of these effects. Now, I've given a few examples of, of how we would be using it. And um, Rory, maybe I can take a pause here before I move to the last part of the... Okay. Uh... Are there any urgent questions? Uh, they uh, weren't on um, clarifying content of your talk. They could wait until the end. They're just like generic ultrasound questions as opposed to specific ones about your talk. So I just wrap it up with the last segment? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, <clears throat> I mean, a primary topic here is how safe is all of this? And I think it, it's still an open question, right? We cannot be um, safe enough. Um, and, and, and it will be very hard to, to de definitely prove that there's a, a, an absolute safety of this technique. So rather we're looking for a guidelines more than hard arbitrary rules. But I think there are quite a few papers out now, uh, even systematic reviews of the available data, mostly focused on histology. In fact, the, the field has quite has matured quite a bit now that shows uh, um, suggestions of possible microstructural damage were perhaps not really interpreted in the right way. And when people try to replicate it, they can explain the original findings, but also show that in fact, there was a misinterpretation and that ultrasound is a lot more safe than previously assumed. I'm pointing to three here, but there are a couple more. Don't be afraid to get in touch. Um, but generally for safety assessments, I think it's important to realize that we shouldn't be going about this blindly and uh, without any suggestion of, how, of what intensity and where we're stimulating. For all of these, the simulations of your acoustic pressure, but also the temperature rise or displacement forces are terribly important. And I'm pointing you to one paper where they love, uh, brilliantly brought all of this together. And um, because these are primates, they could also use MR neuroimaging to in fact confirm with MR imaging the displacement uh, a force and uh, the, the temperature rises that they modeled. And here um, they put them one next to each other, the simulated effects and the in vivo measured effect with a remarkable overlap between the two of them. And so simulating this beforehand is informative for our um, uh, estimations of safety and our focality of stimulation. Doing this in humans is slightly tricky um, because many people don't have CT images. In, in many monkey studies you might have available and some human studies you do have CT images, um, but 
there are several labs working on developing and further improving T1 weighted images for advanced segmentation tools that we have a better idea of the skull or uh, MDixon uh, protocols, that's sort of an MR protocol for better skull imaging with MR. And on the bottom right, you can see how well it compares actually to CT uh, scans. There are a few more uh, particular and specific MR images, um, uh, MR sequences that allow even higher improved skull imaging. And in the next few years, we'll, we'll see this become more standard in running simulations of acoustic intensity. Um, <clears throat> so safety is, is one important aspect to take into account, and simulations can get us uh, quite uh, a, a little while. Another point to take into account is uh, confounds. And I think perhaps the most important confound is an auditory confound. And it's not an auditory confound that you hear the ultrasound at very high frequencies, after all, it's ultrasound. But switching on and off ultrasound will deliver um, a sound wave in itself. Namely, or conventional ultrasound protocols are actually pulsed at a thousand hertz. So it sounds like a thousand hertz. Um, in, in this study that, that's now on my archive and hopefully will be published soon uh, from Oxford, um, they, they were masking this auditory confound with an auditory tone of exactly one uh, kilohertz. And that led to a nearly perfect masking of an auditory confound. Um, others are suggesting that actually a sound wave that is conventionally square, uh, and here you can see on the y-axis uh, auditory brainstem responses, and you can see that especially where the square wave is switched on and off, there's an auditory confound at the start and at the end. But it, if you smooth out this wave, that the auditory confound is gone, but it still actually has a neuromodulatory effect. So um, perhaps in the future, we'll see slightly adapted protocols um, that will have less of an auditory confound, but still uh, the same strength of modulation. Well, in the last few minutes, and I'm afraid that um, this is just really an advertisement for a, a, a few uh, studies, um, I did want to show you how in Oxford we've used it to study cognitive neuroscience. Um, so this is mostly work from Matthew Rushworth lab. And we've studied many different brain regions. Uh, some of this work has been published. Oh, pardon me. And I'll, I'll just give you a flavor um, of what effect it might have for behavior. Uh, consider, for example, a study by Elsa Fouragnan, who's looking at how monkeys make choices. And on the x-axis is time, and on the y-axis is for blue option, how likely it is to lead to reward. Monkeys are choosing not just from one option, but actually from multiple with different changing rewards. So early on, they should choose for the blue one, later on for the orange one. But they're distractors. And in fact, this is a really difficult task for the monkeys if not all options are available at the same time. But Generally, if they would learn this task, what you hope monkeys to do is that they always pick the better option over the worse option. So a blue in the beginning, orange at the end. But after ultrasound at the ACC, particularly this behavior is disrupted. They're less able to dissociate between the better and the worse options. And their behavior that beforehand could be really well specified, and these are their actual choices from one monkey from one session, where there's a clear preference for one um, uh, option all the time is actually becoming muddled up after ultrasound, where there is less of a, a, a dissociation between the different options. Now, in, um, in in this line of work, I hope I've given a suggestion that um, these types of ultrasound are exciting and might take a lot of our boxes for how we would like to to study this. Um, but I also want to acknowledge that there are a million open questions and a, a lot of things yet to be done we need to realize that we're just at the start of a new field. And I think we have a certain responsibility for all of us together to be agnostic and, and not to rely too much on our assumptions. We should be open to be surprised by the new things that we find and a little bit cautious and conservative in the claims that we will be making. For example, this was a, a study by transcranial pulse stimulation with ultrasound in Alzheimer's disease. I, I do want people to uh, read this paper. At the same time, I want to help them appreciate that it, it's not the paper that you would love to see in a really mature field. For example, one is that there, the paper states no conflict of interest, but instead uh, more than half of the authors um, are actually uh, working for a commercial company that sells exactly this device, and they're working at private clinics. Um, in fact, this is a, a, from that study where they show a, a, a remarkable 
um, improvement for Alzheimer's course. But the trial that they present is an open label trial in private clinics with no intervention protocol and no control condition. This is not the way that the, we think we should actually run clinical trials. This is not a clinical trial, but um, it, this should be seen as a first step, as an exploratory step, right? We should keep an open mind for all the possibilities. And when we do so, when we have an open mind, we should be a little bit cautious in making too strong claims. We have not suddenly cured Alzheimer's, as some of the people who are co-authoring this paper are now claiming, right? It's not as if um, uh, ultrasound is really magic and suddenly all our worries are over. Instead, I think it will be helpful if, if we're a little bit humble um, and we look at people uh, who are really leading the field. And I think actually for um, ultrasound and neuromodulation, we're lucky that the field is being led by terrific female leaders in this case. These women are um, uh, absolutely uh, at the very top. And I, I think it's beautiful to see that. Uh, they, um, uh, and, and it's especially gorgeous because Gilta Haar is now retired, um, but has led so many safety boards for um, ultrasound and clinical ultrasound and even high intensity focused ultrasound. Uh, it was a true honor to, to work with all of them together. Um, you can also look up some of the boys that I've listed at the bottom. And if you're interested in, in learning more about this technique, uh, you could, for example, explore a real, for a real clinical view, uh, the Focused Ultrasound Foundation. Um, perhaps for a more early career research perspective, have a look here uh, for BrainBox Initiative. And with a few people in the field, we're coming together in an international working group. And um, this hasn't officially been announced. We're still in all of these discussions, but we hope to open up as, as open as possible for example, we're meeting uh, virtually uh, for NIH Brain Initiative on the 1st and 2nd of June, or um, perhaps um, uh, in, in real life at the FAST Foundation meeting symposium in November. Do get in touch with me if you have questions or look around for new opportunities. I want to advertise two new labs that are starting now and looking in ultrasound by Elsa Fourian, Plymouth, or Axel Tietje in Copenhagen. Both of them have exciting opportunities open for you for at the PhD level and at the postdoc level. Uh, I, I, I would encourage you to check them out. These are brilliant people, and I, I cannot recommend them enough uh, to work to, together with them. My own work has been uh, mostly done in, in Oxford, and of course, it's not just my work. In fact, it's a whole large team uh, that's behind this. And I especially want to thank uh, Rogier Mars, but um, um, mainly Jerome Sele and Matthew Rushworth uh, for leading this effort. I've now started my own lab for human ultrasound neuromodulation at the Donners Institute. Uh, and, and this summer um, I, I have an opening for a PhD student. And I think the vacancy will be announced um, end of May or early June. Uh, but if you have an interest or more questions, you can get in touch with me now. Thank you very much. We, sure. we do have a few questions if you're happy to take them. Yeah, um, gray matter tracks depression, TUS analogous to TMS uh, or TES. Um, well, in, in fact, I, I would mostly um, guess that TUS is analogous to TUS. It's really a novel modality, uh, but if you need any background on, on how this um, could best be approached, I think probably TES is the closest, right? It's like ultra focal TES, even deep in the brain. It, and I really think it's more about that delayed neuromodulatory effect. Um, and and I, I'm actually very keen to see more research about comparing all three of them in, in a much closer um, um, manner. Um, but, but think about it more as modulation than stimulation. Uh, postdocs may not be able to get ethics board approval to collect individual CT scans. And then how do you go without them? Well, um, I would actually recommend you to try to go for ethics approval for CT scans um, because CT scans that are good enough for um, ultrasound are at a much lower intensity than or much lower, lower radiation dose than conventional CT scans. Um, so we'll be getting them in Nijmegen and they're getting them in Copenhagen and Paris and in Oxford and in London. Um, so others have, 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 um, uh, have successfully got them for you. 
but I don't think CT scans should be the end station. It should be what you really, um, uh, it's not the end solution for uh, getting the best acoustic simulation. So um, I think we can get a long way with specialized MR sequences. I've highlighted a few of them, uh, but generally the approach that we would recommend as an international working group is actually to take a worst case scenario and where you um, uh, assume that the skull is super thick uh, that will be horrible for your temperature rise. And at the same time, you're going to assume that your skull is nearly non-existent because that would be horrible for your peak intensity. And if you're safe, that if you know that you're safe in the worst case scenarios, you also know that you're safe um, in your current scenario. Uh, there are a few others. Actually, with many other labs, I talk about this uh, for hours and how to best approach this. And I would recommend you to get in touch with me and just ask me a question and I can share some specific slides and, and suggestions on how to do this. For the next question, um, is there a reason to think that stimulation targets uh, particular cell types based on their morphology or physiology? God, I love that question. I mean, we're pretty sure that it should, right? I mean, it's not as if anything in the brain is going to experience exactly the same modulation. It should be specific. It's just that we haven't mapped this out. I mean, there's an enormous opportunity to, to really try and, and, and delve deeper in the specificity of cell type. But here, I would like to take just one moment to highlight that I've been talking about neuromodulation, but we have to realize that half of the brain is made up of glial cells. And there is some evidence, a beautiful paper in current biology last year, and actually a few more, showing glial cell modulation, astrocyte modulation by ultrasound. Um, it, it, there is a lot of possibilities, and actually some, even some suggestions that ultrasound can modulate vasodilation as modulated by glial cells. So um, a lot to be discovered, not a lot that we know at the moment. As a next question, is there any evidence of uh, TUS impact on schizophrenia? Uh, no, nobody has studied this at the moment that I'm aware of, but can we modulate glutamate and dopamine circuits effectively? I think, yes, we can, um, but uh, there are only a few labs that in rodent models are now starting to actually measure the glutamate and dopamine levels as modulated by ultrasound. So this pharmacological approach, neuropharmacological approach is only starting now. And I, I, I think um, it, 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 it needs a bit, a bit more work. As a next question, um, uh, the person is asking, I'm not sure what mechanism you propose to explain the long lasting effects on function. That's right, actually, I was a bit vague about that. And at the start, I seem to be suggesting that there was a main direct effect uh, that could interfere, but how can you have long lasting effects? Well, at this stage, I think it's important to realize that um, we're stimulating a whole circuit and it could have physiological effects, just like TMS can have a direct effect. But if you repeat TMS in a certain pattern or protocol, you can activate neurons that can lead to cascade physiological changes with longer lasting effects. Just for TMS, one TMS pulse will um, uh, elicit, uh, elicit even um, inhibitory response with GABA being released for up to 100 milliseconds. Repetitive TMS pulses can build on this and lead to mechanisms that are much like long-term potentiation or long-term depression. These are physiological mechanisms of um, uh, plasticity. And it's in fact, uh, in exactly the similar mechanisms that we propose that our ultrasound protocol interferes. In fact, I don't think it's an accident that we're repeating this at, at 10 Hertz. Now, but do I know exactly what mechanism and what physiological mechanism I think is underlying? No, no, I don't. I absolutely don't. It could even be mediated by the glial cell pathway that I um, suggested to before. Um, I, I could talk about for a few hours about different physiological mechanisms, but again, this is an open question. And I'm actually going to pause it here and move to the next one. And Amir is asking, is it possible to use ultrasound for doing a reversible lesion, quote unquote, in the cortex, for example, close to the skull, uh, or does it work well mainly in deep brain structures? Well, um, both. Um, we've shown it uh, both deep and superficial uh, gray matter structures. It seems to work quite well on, on, on both these um, structures. It, it doesn't really matter that much. Uh, there is a difference in uh, how easy it is to focus somewhere and how easy it is to um, uh, to ensure safety. Um, but we haven't really discovered a, a 
a major difference that it's possible some in one place and not in another place. Uh, just to highlight, I think by now we've stimulated uh, uh, maybe 14 different cortical sites all over the brain. And um, it seems to work wherever we try it. As next question, um, is there any evidence for TUS inducing LTD or LTP-like effect in the human motor cortex? No, there's not. Um, I, we briefly discussed LTP and LTD-like uh, mechanisms, but it hasn't been done in the human motor cortex. And we've been actually quite conservative in translating these repetitive ultrasound protocols to humans. And we are cautiously warning others to, to do so. Um, this is a relatively novel protocol and um, it's, we were worried about mechanical fatigue effects. That if you deliver a lot of energy over a long time, that if you push, 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 that actually you might weaken uh, the, the structural contents. That's actually why we looked at histology. It's also the, the, one of the reasons why we were a little bit uh, cautious in humans. Now, if you approach this cautiously, I do think it's possible to start investigating this. And in my lab, we'll actually be looking at this uh, I won't be starting with 40 seconds just straight, but we can start from the other side of where we know it's safe. Look at one second of repetitive ultrasound, then two seconds, then five seconds. And I think, again, in the motor system is probably the, the best studied uh, and the ideal circuit uh, to start answering these questions. Yeah, okay. So these are all of the questions and, yep. and no new questions have come in. Brilliant. So I'd just like to take this as an opportunity to thank you again. I think this is the fourth or fifth time I've watched you speak and I've just been engaged, I've been engaged just as much as I was the first. So thank you very much for your time and your effort and your enthusiasm. Once again, we really appreciate it. And I'm sure the delegates do as well. Thanks, Rory. That's wonderful. Talk to you soon.